Let's look at a cross section of the heart and name the four chambers of the heart and compare their function. This image from your textbook is fairly overwhelming at first. There's lots of things labeled on there, but we're going to take our time looking at it and go through each of the portions. The four chambers of the heart are the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle. What you'll notice is that there's a right side to the heart and a left side to the heart, and the upper chambers are called the atria, and the lower chambers are the ventricles. The function of the atria are as blood returns back from the heart, it pools into the atria, and some of it will actually move down into the ventricles, but then the atria will contract to pump the maximum amount of blood down into the ventricles. The ventricles role then is to actually pump the blood up and out through the vessels at the top of the heart in order to pump the blood out to the body and to the lungs. I will look more closely at these vessels and their functions in a moment. But overall, this is the function of the atria and the ventricles. We'll also compare and contrast the right and left side of the heart, but we'll do that in just a few moments here. So let's name the valves of the heart and explain their function. Within the heart, there are four valves. The pulmonic valve, the aortic valve, the bicuspid valve, and the tricuspid valve. In order to break down the names of these valves, the pulmonic valve is a valve that is right at the beginning of the pulmonary artery. The aortic valve is a valve that is right at the beginning of the aorta. The bicuspid valve gets its name because it's made up of two flaps and therefore bicuspid. The tricuspid valve has three flaps and therefore is tricuspid. Overall, the function of these valves is to prevent backflow within the cardiovascular system and the heart itself. As blood is being pumped around the cardiovascular system by the heart, as the heart contracts and squeezes blood out of itself, or as the atria contract and squeeze blood down into the ventricles, we don't want then blood to be moving backwards in the system. In the sense of, as the heart relaxes, we don't want the blood that was just pumped out into the vessels to flow back down into the heart. We don't want the blood that was just squeezed down into the ventricles by the atria to be pumped back up into the atria when the ventricles contract. So we have these four valves to ultimately prevent this backflow. So we can take a look at the inside of the heart and at these valves. Specifically, let's focus in on the tricuspid and bicuspid valves. We can see here that the tricuspid separates the right atria from the right ventricle. We can see that the bicuspid valve separates the left atria from the left ventricle. As was just mentioned, when those atria contract, they squeeze blood down into the ventricles, and then as the ventricles contract, they prevent backflow up into the atria, and instead direct the blood up into the arteries that are coming out the top of the heart. As you can see here, another term that is often used for the bicuspid valve that is used within the healthcare field is the mitral valve. The mitral valve comes from the fact of the, the mitral valve name comes from the shape of the valve itself. Where bicuspid meant it had two flaps, the mitral valve is a shape that's related to the hat a bishop would wear, as can be seen in the image here. If we were to invert that hat, it's got the same shape as the valve. How I remember these terms and use them interchangeably is that the bicuspid valve starts with BI and the mitral valve starts with MI. Sometimes, just to aid this memory trick, I pronounce it mitral valve so that I remember my and bi. The semilunar valves are the aortic and pulmonic that were mentioned in the previous slide. These are found at the beginning of the aorta artery and the pulmonary artery. And so the aortic valve prevents backflow from the aorta back into the ventricle after contraction. And the pulmonic valve prevents backflow from the pulmonary arteries back down into the ventricle. The reason they're called semilunar valves is because when you look at them, they look as a partial moon shape. If we break down the term semilunar, semi means partially, and lunar is referring to the moon. And so the pulmonic valve is sometimes called the pulmonary semilunar valve. The aortic is the aortic semilunar valve.
So now let's take a closer look at the functions of the right and left sides of the heart. We'll go back to this image that we looked at earlier when we first introduced the atria and the ventricles. Here we have the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Superior, as you remember from earlier in the course, means above or from the top of the body. The inferior refers to below or coming up from the bottom of the body. Vena cava stands for vein that's large like a cave. And so the superior and inferior vena cava are the veins that ultimately bring back blood from the top and the bottom portion of the body to the heart. They empty into the right atrium. We mentioned the atria earlier on, and the blood as it returns from the body empties from the vena cava into the right atrium, and the blood will flow through the tricuspid valve down into the ventricle, but then eventually the atria will contract, squeezing the maximum amount of blood down from the atria into the ventricles. Here we have the tricuspid valve that we saw a moment ago. So the blood flows down from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. When the ventricles contract, the blood from the right ventricle will move up through the pulmonary semilunar valve, shown here, up into the pulmonary artery. There's the right pulmonary and left pulmonary artery that lead to the right and left lung. Ultimately, this term pulmonary refers to lungs. And so the pulmonary arteries are the arteries going out from the heart towards the lungs. So we've looked now at the right side of the heart. The blood within the right side of the heart is coming back from the body after giving off oxygen and collecting carbon dioxide from the cells of the body. They're giving off oxygen so the cells of the body can make ATP. They're collecting carbon dioxide as a waste from making ATP through the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So the right side of the heart's function is to collect deoxygenated blood back from the body and then ultimately pump it out to the left and right lung. When the blood gets out to the left and right lung, there is gas exchange where carbon dioxide is given off from the blood to the lungs and oxygen comes in from the lungs into the blood. After becoming oxygenated and getting rid of carbon dioxide in the lungs, the blood is returned via the right and left pulmonary veins. Again, that term pulmonary is referring to the lungs. And so oxygenated blood is coming back along these pairs of veins to the left atria. This oxygenated blood goes into the left atrium, and then it will travel down through the bicuspid valve. And then when the atria contracts, it will squeeze the maximum amount of blood down into the left ventricle. When the left ventricle contracts, it pumps blood up through the aortic semilunar valve to the aorta. As you can see, there's lots of branching in the aorta as it branches off to bring blood to the arms, to the head, and it wraps around the heart to the descending aorta that then brings blood down to the lower part of the body. One thing to repeat here is as the ventricles contract, the tri and bicuspid valves close to prevent backflow of blood up into the atria from the ventricles. As well, the pulmonary and aortic semilunar valves, after blood has moved up into the aorta and into the pulmonary arteries, will close so that blood does not flow back from those vessels down into the heart itself. And so we can see here that the left side of the heart is involved in getting oxygenated blood back from the lungs and then pumping it out to the body through the aorta. Something else to note is that while we follow this path through from the superior and inferior vena cava through out to the aorta, all of this is happening at once and our heart is constantly beating at the approximately 70 beats per minute that a normal heart beats at. And it's not a flow through of blood from the right atrium to the right ventricle out to the lungs and then that blood comes back and then we have more blood come into the heart. But the atria are contracting at the exact same time and then the ventricles are contracting at the exact same time. So that blood is coming into the top of the heart and being squeezed down into the ventricles of both sides of the heart. And then they're both squeezing at the same time, squeezing blood, 
pumping blood up through the arteries that we see coming out the top of the heart. In the end, this next image lays out the functions of the right and left sides of the heart. Because we can compare the pulmonary and systemic circuits relative to location and function, if we look at it relative to the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. The right side of the heart receives deoxygenated blood back from the systemic circulation. Systemic circulation meaning the circulation that goes to all the systems of our body and it pumps that blood back out to the lungs. And so it's pumping into the pulmonary circuit. When the blood arrives at the lungs, there's gas exchange, oxygen going into the blood, carbon dioxide coming out of the blood into the lungs. And then that oxygenated blood continues around the pulmonary circulation back to the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart then pumps that oxygenated blood out to the body to provide oxygen to all our systems, hence the beginning of the systemic circulation here. And then we continue back to the heart and out to the lungs and the cycle continues. Hence the name that you hear sometimes, not cardiovascular system, but the circulatory system. It's circulatory because the blood constantly cycles through this system. There's another circuit that we need to take a look at, and it's relative to the fact that the heart is made up of tissues and cells itself. Ultimately, those cells need oxygen and other nutrients in order to create energy and stay alive. And so this system is called the coronary circuit. And here we want to describe the blood supply to the myocardium or the coronary circuit. If we take a look at this region here, we can see the aorta coming up out of the heart. But the coronary artery branches off the aorta almost instantly. This is the right coronary artery. Here we have the left coronary artery, where we can see the attachment point to the aorta, but in a similar fashion, the left coronary artery branches off of the aorta. These arteries move across the heart, go to the left anterior descending artery, go to the posterior descending artery, and the circumflex arteries in order to provide oxygenated and nutrient-filled blood to all of the tissues of the heart. Of course, once the oxygen is given off, then the blood vessels collect carbon dioxide from the tissues of the heart, as well as other wastes. And then that blood is returned via the cardiac veins. The cardiac veins end up at the coronary venous sinus, which ultimately puts this blood into the right atrium, which we saw earlier collects deoxygenated blood from the superior and inferior vena cava as well.